Hello and welcome to this podcast from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller and my guest today is radio astronomer turned writer and broadcaster Marcus Chan. Marcus is currently cosmology consultant for New Scientist magazine, as well as the author of several highly successful popular science titles. These include, and you can tell that Marcus has a talent for titles, The Never-Ending Days of Being Dead, Quantum Theory Cannot Hurt You, and now we need to talk about Kelvin. This new book starts with everyday experiences as simple as seeing your face reflected in a window pane, and shows that with a guide as expert and entertaining as Marcus, many things we take for granted provide clues to how our universe works at the deepest level. I asked Marcus first where the idea for the book came from. Well, I live a kind of double life as, as an author. Uh, most of the time I, I, I work at home, don't really talk to anyone, have a really quiet life, me and the goldfish. And then you, then you come to the kind of publication phase where you go out and you uh, uh, meet lots of people in a mad rush. Uh, whereas you've actually written a large explanation of, of something, you know, that's maybe thousands of words or long, you're, you're faced with like one and a half minutes to explain it. And, and so I kind of like grasp for, for some kind of everyday example, everyday object to, to relate what I'm, what I'm, you know, what, what I want to explain to, you know, the cosmic thing I'm trying to explain. And I remember I was doing a talk in Edinburgh and I was trying to explain why we have quantum theory. You know, what, what, why, why, what, where did that come from? Quantum theory is our, our very best theory of the microscopic world of atoms and their constituents. And it kind of overthrew all the physics that came before. And I was trying to think, what, what, what was the conflict that triggered that, that theory? And, and it occurred to me that it was simply that we have a theory of matter, which says that matter is made of atoms, tiny little indivisible grains. And we have a theory of light. And the theory of light says that light is a wave, pretty much like a, a ripple on a pond. And the one thing you know about uh, ripples on a pond is they're kind of spread out. They take up a lot of space. But atoms are tiny, tiny things. And so I, I, I realised that actually when uh, an atom gives out light, which is of course what happens in a filament of a light bulb, or when uh, light is absorbed by an atom, which happens in your eye, it turns out that the light waves are something like 50,000 times bigger than the atoms. So it's very much like an atom spitting out a, a light wave is pretty much like opening a matchbox and that comes a 40 ton truck. Or alternatively, an atom absorbing light is pretty much, you know, you know, you've got a matchbox, you take it out your pocket, you open it, and a 40 ton truck can drive into it. So here's the conflict, that's the conflict. That is the, that is the paradox that hit physics in the, in the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. How could they reconcile these two theories? Because you know, they, they just, uh, this interface between light and matter, they conflict and they say impossible things. And of course the resolution turns out to be that actually light is not a wave, it's actually a particle. So it, it's actually, uh, it streams through space as a series of, of tiny little bullets, and we call them photons. And so the, the, that's, that's what actually happens, the, the photons are pretty much the size of atoms. But there's, there's more to it than that because it turns out that light is also a wave. You know, so we can't abandon that old picture. And it's simultaneously a light and a wave. And this is where physics departs really from our intuition because we have to accept that, that light is something for which we have, no, we have no word in our vocabulary and we have no picture of anything in our everyday world which can, can really give us, tell us what light is in its entirety. You go back to the Greeks and you show that this impulse to to use metaphors and to relate the known to the unknown or to explain the unknown by means of the known is a very long-lasting human impulse. But I suppose what's happened in the last few decades is, as you're saying, that the tools are, are becoming more and more worn. It's becoming more and more difficult because the concepts are becoming more and more alien to to be related to the normal yeah. everyday life that we have around us. And I see that I see that as actually happening. It was a crucial moment in a, in the late nineteenth century when this actually happened. We remember that Newton came up with a picture of the world, a clockwork picture. You know, I mean, we had these laws of gravity or whatever. We if we know where the moon is today, we know exactly where it is tomorrow. You know, we use Newton's laws of motion, his law of gravity. We can predict. You know, it's a clockwork universe. And uh, these were the models, that, that the pictures, the images that, that physicists tended to use to understand the world. 
until they came up, really, we're talking about mid-19th century, when they were trying to understand electricity and magnetism. And the great Scottish physicist, James Clerk Maxwell, was trying to understand magnetism. I mean, we all know if we get a magnet and we put it near some iron filings, there's some kind of mysterious force that reaches out through the space and touches and, or, or, and, and tugs on the, the iron filing. So he was trying to think, how could that happen? And he thought, well, maybe there are little cogs you know, invisible cogs between the magnet and the iron filing. So, you know, that the magnet somehow turns a little toothed cog, which turns another toothed cog, and eventually it touches the iron filing. So that's how it, how a force reaches through empty space. But it didn't work, his picture didn't work, so he then thought, well, maybe the cogs, maybe they're kind of springy. You've got all these springy cogs. One turns that, you know, one turns, it turns the next one. And eventually he threw up his hands in despair and gave up completely and realised that there was no picture, there was no mechanical picture. And that what, what really was around the magnet was what we call a magnetic field. This is a kind of a, a force field, an invisible force field, a tension in space. And the magnet creates this force field and it spreads through space and it's the force field that actually touches the the iron filing. So at this point, he, he you know, physics actually detached itself from physical pictures and we realise that that nature's language is actually a mathematical language, a language of force fields and really that was a a critical moment in the history of physics because if you look at the physics that came after that we're talking about atoms which can be in two places at once, we're talking about Einstein's theory of gravity which where gravity is actually the curvature of four dimensional space time we cannot ever get our heads around four dimensional space time because we are three dimensional creatures and the current theory, which is creating a lot of excitement, is called string theory, where we see the fundamental building blocks of the matter as tiny little vibrating violin strings, but they live in ten dimensions. We've really given up on, on trying to explain nature in terms of things which are like the, the things that we see in the everyday world. But in retrospect, why should nature be like the everyday world? I mean, you know, our intuition, is, is as was developed... Um, you know, millions of years ago on, on the African plains, when we, you know, we had to survive with, you know, lions and, and vicious creatures, so we, we, we had to be able to run, we had to be able to see to the horizon, we had to hit here reasonably well, but nature and, and natural selection did not equip us with senses to sense the atomic world or the world of galaxies or whatever, so to me it's not surprising that those worlds are counterintuitive yeah i thought that was a very interesting point you made about how we've evolved and you know we're we're equipped for foraging and running but we're not equipped we find it difficult to cope with the very large and the very small let alone multi-dimensionality don't we the problems start quite quickly once you get to a certain order of magnitude you know to the power of 10 then yeah. most of us have difficulty grasping that we do, and you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to uh, pretend that I can grasp the vastness of the universe. But as a kid, uh, I was always fascinated by the bigness of it, and I was always trying to get my head around it. And I do, I do think that children are fascinated by this. This is why they're interested in dinosaurs and things. You know, big things really fascinate kids. So uh, I'm, I'm constantly trying to get my head around it. But unfortunately, we, we you know, we, we, we cannot in, in, in the end ever do it. I do remember trying to for an article I wrote for New Scientist magazine. I remember trying to figure out I was trying to imagine how big the universe was and the universe is populated by galaxies they're the building blocks of the universe and there are about a hundred billion of them we live in one it's called the Milky Way I I do remember thinking well if the universe was about a kilometre it was a sphere about a kilometre across then the hundred billion galaxies floating in that sphere would be each about the size of an aspirin Mm. and Milky Way uh, is in a group of galaxies called the local group contains about 30 galaxies only one other big galaxy it's called andromeda you can see it in the skies if you know where to look and it's about 13 centimeters away another aspirin and the the nearest cluster of galaxies is the virgo cluster of galaxies and that's about the size of a basketball and it's about three meters away so i began to get some kind of picture actually the universe is not really big compared to galaxies atoms are very small compared to us but galaxies are actually pretty big compared to the the universe that we're in and that tells you something interesting about galaxies they must collide a lot and when we actually look back with the hubble space telescope we we, when we look at great distance we're we're seeing back in time we see galaxies which are very, very different to the ones today. So we can see that collisions and mergers and things like that have had a big role to play in the evolution of galaxies like our Milky Way.